So a little over a year ago, I uh, purchased a uh, cell phone that has a 128 gig memory on it. And uh, right away I started recording everything. And last fall, I discovered that, hey, the part because my uh, video camera broke, that I could just record all my classes using my cell phone. And so of course I did that. And of course once you do that, you realize that once you record something and post it on YouTube or whatever, you never really have to say that thing again as long as you do a decent job. And then of course you start recording all your talks and you realize that once you've recorded a talk and posted it on YouTube, why ever give that talk again? But the logical conclusion to that is that therefore every time you give a talk, you have to give a brand new talk. And so this is actually the third sort of de novo talk that I'll have given so far this year, and I'm slated to give two more talks um, that are going to be completely different. And that's pretty remarkable for a guy who actually doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so with that introduction, I'll get back to that. There's actually a reason for that. So phage therapy from a pharmacological perspective, various perspectives on how to improve the art. Wondering whether having perspective in that title twice is actually an improvement or, or, or takes away from the title. That's because I edit too much. So we all know what phage therapy is because we've already seen one talk on phage therapy today. But phage therapy is approximately a 100-year-old uh, use of bacterial viruses to combat especially uh, pathogenic bacteria. And then we have to ask the question, uh, when should we be using phage therapy? And the obvious one, everybody's answer will be, is when you have infections that are antibiotic resistant. You know, if you can't treat it with an antibiotic, you want to get rid of it, you've got to come up with something else, and phages are a reasonable alternative. But another thing that, that people don't think about too much is there's also something called antibiotic tolerance. And in antibiotic tolerance, what you have are bacteria that essentially are genetically sensitive to antibiotic, which means that if you take them out of the person or whatever they're infecting, put them on a plate, it'll be sensitive to antibiotics, sensitive enough so that the antibiotic should be able to kill off bacteria that they don't. But instead, these bacteria enter into a physiological state um, in which uh, they, in fact, are temporarily resistant to antibiotics, these uh, persistent phenotypes. And when you've got a chronic infection, especially that's antibiotic tolerant, um, you need to come up with something other than antibiotics to treat them with, and phages are a reasonable possibility. Uh, and then lastly, there are reasons not to use antibiotics. Uh, Randy Fish in uh, Liverpool gave this wonderful talk about uh, treatment of uh, diabetic infections using phages. And he kept saying, you know, these are really sick people, and you start giving them antibiotics, and you're going to cause liver damage. Liver damage. I mean, but I, what I tend to think of is uh, simply your negatively, uh, potentially negatively affecting our microbiomes um, to short-term uh, consequences that are not good or longer-term. So these are reasons why you might want to use phages. This is the kind of stuff I do. And when I say I don't do anything, I, I, I'm only slightly exaggerating. Uh, this is a uh, paper, a review that I put together for a book for ASM. It's still under review to see whether it's going to be published elsewhere um, besides that book, but whatever. Uh, I just looked up, uh, using quotes, the uh, phrase phage therapy uh, on Google Scholar um, to see how many times it was used. And that's it right here. Oh, you can't really see that. That's it right here. And then suddenly, in the late 90s, we get a big bump in the use of the phrase phage therapy. And then it kind of dropped off in the early 2000s. But now it's going up again. I find it fascinating that you rarely see it prior to the 1990s. People were clearly using different words, or it wasn't in English. Uh, but we are clearly in a point where we're having a, a, a renaissance maybe a second renaissance of looking at phages with antibacterials. And in fact, right now, the mentions of phage therapy at Google Scholar are doubling at a rate uh, about every four years. So why use phages? So this comes from a paper I published with a uh, very talented undergrad a number of years ago. And this is just a blow up of that. This is just a list of why you use phages, uh, why you use phages as antibacterial agents in phage therapy. 
Uh, and uh, below this line or dotted line are things that I think are not as important. Above the dotted line, I feel these are more important things. So why do you stage the antibacterial agents? Well, first of all, they're bactericidal. Not even all antibiotics are bactericidal. Autodosing, the idea that you actually put phages in, they'll increase their numbers when they contact target bacteria. They have a low inherent toxicity. I mean, they consist of DNA and protein. I mean, they do have some genes that you gotta like, watch out for, particularly in temperate phages. Um, but, but generally, phages don't have a high amount of toxicity. I've never heard about that. But they have a low impact on normal flora because they have uh, mostly narrow host ranges. Also, because of the narrow host ranges, they have narrow uh, potential for resistance evolution. You're not throwing an antibiotic that affects all the bacteria. You're throwing in something that just affects a very limited number of bacteria that you that you have in your uh, environment that you're targeting. And therefore, the opportunities for evolution uh, is just relatively low. A uh, lack of cross-resistance with antibiotics, a rapid discovery process, I and mean, that's really the great thing about phages, right? You just go to the sewer and you get your phages, ideally at least. Uh, you can modify these things. You can modify them phenotypically, you can evolve them, you can genetic engineer them. You can use them with other agents, so um, you could use phages with antibiotics, not necessarily in all circumstances, but uh, you can have combinations of, uh, of different kinds of drugs, phages being one of them. There's versatility in the dosing, there's all sorts of ways of throwing phages at different individuals, different types of infections. Phages can clear biofilms. In fact, last year I published a paper um, arguing why phages are superior to antibiotics as anti-biofilm agents based upon the perceived ecology of phages as antibacterial agents versus antibiotics as antibacterial agents. Uh, and phages have favorable pharmacokinetics. I don't really understand exactly how they move around the body, but they seem to do it very effectively despite the fact that they're relatively massive things. That table, actually, I was going to put into this paper here, um, the pros and cons of phage therapy, which was published in 2011 with um, Catherine Blunt from you. But Catherine didn't want to put the table in there, so I used it in a separate supplement. Separate this is the, a much better cited and known paper than the uh, Kurt Wright and Avedon paper. I think it's the number four cited uh, paper uh, in bacteria phage. And I thank Martha for that, because I think you're number three. <laughs> Keeping me out of that number three spot. This is from that ASM uh, manuscript that's supposedly going to be in a book. Bugs is Drugs, I think it's called, but maybe published elsewhere as well. These are all of the um, phage treatment of humans articles that I could find since, I think, 1980. The latest one is the uh, one by Randy Fish and Betty Cutter and others, which is a diabetic toe paper that uh, came out this uh, summer. By and large, and as we saw when um, Dr. Gorski was talking, uh, these are treatments of chronic bacterial infections. Not entirely, but there's a lot of treatment of chronic bacterial infections. Too. And as Dr. Gorski said as well, that's cut off on the bottom. I suspect that phage therapy in the pre antibiotics era tended to be initiated sooner after infections presentation, it probably says, versus as against long term chronic bacterial infections of today. And again, Dr. Gorski said that, but he was referring back to the 1980s, saying, oh yeah, they were treating acute infections. Not the chronic ones we're, we're, um, we're treating today, but I'm actually referring to what was going on in the 1920s and 1930s. There's a lot of papers out there. And, you know, a person shows up, there's no antibiotics, because, you know, antibiotics basically hadn't been invented yet. And what are they treated with? They treated with phages. And they seem to, not entirely, but they seem to have a lot of success. Which led to the question of, okay, if chronic infections are really important today as in terms of targets, uh, targets of phage therapy, then what are we doing about model systems or studying the use of phages against chronic bacterial infections? And the answer is probably not enough. This is a paper that uh, was published in uh, July, I think. This is one of my made-up papers where I was like, I had a deadline a week later, and I was like, what am I going to do? And I was like, oh, I'll make this up. And so I put it all together and it was published a month later. It's wonderful to be able to do stuff like that. I don't know how I get away with it. Uh, but this is all the papers that I could find where we are talking. It's not the emphasis of this uh, paper, but it's this table. It's all the papers I could find that um, 
use model systems, animals <coughs> where they have infections that have lasted more than 24 hours between the bacterial challenge and the addition of phages. So these are our presumptive chronic bacterial infections uh, that, that have been published. And that's been cut off. So what I, in looking at that, I said, well, are they really chronic bacterial infections in the same sense as we see in the clinic? And the answer I came to is that maybe they're not, maybe we don't have good criteria for what is a chronic bacterial infection in a model system. So we can start with something that actually is like what we have in the clinic and try to figure out how to raise up our, uh, our uh, success rates above that 40% reduction for us to tell them success. So I figured we should have a, a, a number of criteria. So first of all, you should have certainly more than 24 hours between bacterial challenge and uh, hitting members of phages. I mean, it can be days, it can be weeks, who knows, it can be months. There should be a, an equivalent amount of site preparation needed. If you're in the clinic going to be using debridement, you ought to be using something other than debridement. I mean, sorry, you should ought to be using debridement in your animal model as well. And then because I'm kind of making this stuff up as I go, I figured that two of the next three criteria ought to be met if we're going to call this a chronic infection that maybe is similar to what's going on. And one of them is that, uh, really, if you can just throw one dose of phages and the infection goes away, it's probably not that difficult of an infection to treat compared to what you're seeing in the clinic. That's not always the case. I did say two out of three. Uh, it should be that you actually demonstrate that there are biofilms there, since biofilms typically are associated with chronic bacterial infections. Not necessarily always, but again, I did say two out of three. And finally, it'd be nice to be able to show that, in fact, there's antibiotic tolerance going on in here, that the infection has reached the point where, in fact, if you try treating it with antibiotics and you're not getting success, maybe now that's the point where you can say, aha, this is a chronic bacterial infection that mimics an infection uh, in the clinic where you're trying to treat it with antibiotics, but you're not getting success even though the bacteria is not working. So these have all been published in this commentary that I uh, published um, this year. Well, I'm losing all of my comps. So um, the next part of the talk is really the, the center of the talk. Uh, and this is, I was asked to write a methods paper. And I wrote back to the editor. And I said, it's tough for me to sub page therapy. It's tough for me to write a methods paper because I don't do anything. So I can't write about any methods. And I said, all I can really do is complain a lot. And the editor wrote back and said, That'd be fine. So I've been working on this uh, paper there where I complain about a lot, and these are the highlights. So these are phase <coughs> therapy things that I think are relevant that people don't necessarily pay attention to when they're doing phase therapy. So first of all, our Poisson distributions and phage killing titers. So it's actually possible to guesstimate Especially if you're assuming that the phages are not going to be actually increasing their numbers after you hit the, the bacteria with them, that how many of the bacteria should die? You would think that if you had an easy way of saying, aha, I have this many bacteria, this many phages, and I can predict how many bacteria actually should die, that people just use that, but they don't. If you hit a phage with a ratio of one phage, sorry, bacteria, the ratio of one phage to bacteria, you should get 37% bacteria survival. 2 to 1, 14%, 5 to 1, uh, sorry, 3 to 1, 5% survival, and 5 to uh, 1, 1% 1 survival. It just comes out of the Poisson distribution. It's easy to do this, and at least it gives you a baseline of whether or not your phages are reaching all the bacteria and killing all the bacteria. I mean, they might be doing better than that. They might be doing worse than that, but it's nice to, you know, have a little comparison. It's really important to have the right Higher, that's sufficiently high in association with your bacteria when you're doing phage therapy. I like to say we should have about 10 to the 8 per ml, phages per ml, in association with the bacteria over micron length distances. So it doesn't have to be in your toe at 10 to the 8 if you're treating your eye. But in, in the actual infection, you should be shooting for 10 to the 8. Now that's a made up number, but it's a conservatively made up number. And this is a basis of the number. So this is a back of the envelope calculation. If you had 10 to 8 phages per ml, you had an absorption constant of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 9, and you allowed the phages to sit in association with the bacteria for 10 minutes, then you would get 8% survival, assuming that the phages found the bacteria and they're all back to survival. 
which is pretty good. Now, you're not necessarily going to get 8%. It might not work out that way. You might get 20% survival or 50% survival after, after your 10 minutes. So that's why it's 10 to the 8 and it's conservative. But if you switch that to 10 to the 7 and run through the same calculation, you get 78% bacteria survival, OK? So 8% versus 78%. It's a tenfold difference. It kind of makes sense. But this is why you getting sufficient numbers of phages in association with your bacteria during treatment is a good thing. And note that I'm not saying you have to add that many phages. Actively means that the phages can reach that number because they've replicated. I don't care how the phages reach those densities or higher. It's just that they really need to if you're going to have effectively getting rid of these bacteria. The many problems with multiplicity, whoops, backwards, the many problems with multiplicity of infection. It's a poorly defined, poorly used, and poorly understood concept. So it's multiplicity of infection, not addition. It says infection, and that's where the phrase came from. Even if you read that, oh, no, traditionally it was multiplicity of addition, and then it became, well, that's, that's BS. It's multiplicity of infection. It's not multiplicity of addition. When people use multiplicity of infection, they're usually just describing relative numbers of phages. I mean, obviously, there's a quantitative basis of this. But really, what they mean is, oh, a multiplicity of 10 is tenfold bigger than 1. Well, why don't you just say that? Or better yet, just say, this is the amount of phages I've added. Because how is anybody supposed to repeat a protocol if actual phage numbers are not explicitly provided? And there are papers out there that do not tell you how many phages it actually added to the bacteria. In model systems, <coughs> and it's crazy. And this is in press. It's, uh, you can find it on the bacteria page that is um, just about ready to come out. I just complained for like 3,000 words about multiplicity of infection. That's what I do. <coughs> targets to climb to zero faster when there are fewer targets. Growing bacterial populations mostly are not our targets. It's especially true for chronic bacterial infections. This is basic microbiology. You know, if you can first reduce the number of target bacteria and then hit them with your disinfectant, you're going to kill off those bacteria faster. That's why you clean up the still before you um, try to sterilize or whatever. You use clean glassware rather than dirty glassware. Now, this is a little confusing because Payne et al., I'm not criticizing, but Payne et al. made the argument that in order to have effective phage therapy, you need a certain number of bacteria around. But that's referring to active treatment, where the phages actually have to increase their numbers. It's not referring to the phages simply getting rid of the bacteria. To get rid of the bacteria, ideally, you're going to start with as few bacteria as possible, and then hit them with large numbers of phages, OK? It's just basic microbiology. Phage therapy is not inherently reliant on phage replication. What's really important is bacteriocidal activity. So we've got, is that an alarm or something? That's good. <laughs> There's a something, it's a creep. So we've got passive treatment where you're just relying on the phages reaching the bacteria and killing them. It needs, the phages need to be bactericidal, but they don't even need to lyse the bacteria, really. At the other end of the spectrum, you have active treatment where, in fact, the phages have to not only infect the bacteria, but they have to replicate and increase their numbers to reach that magical 10 to the 8 in order to actually wipe out the bacteria reaching the patient, on invasion of pressure. But basic phage therapy, at an absolute minimum, you need to have the bacteria be bactericidal. It's good if they replicate. That's what this passive active is all about. The idea that you can have the phages reach the bacteria and then get this extra boost because they're increasing their population size as well as phages are. But minimally, you need bactericidal activity. And what's really important is phages are not toxic. And Dr. Gorski talked about this this morning. But that comes with the caveat that the phages need to be reasonably well chosen. And we have all sorts of arguments about what reasonably well chosen means, but it probably means some kind of bioinformatic analysis. I have a tendency to, at this point, say, oh, poo poo, we shouldn't be using temperate phages um, in phage therapy. But I'm in the process of thinking about putting together a manuscript where I say, in fact, maybe we shouldn't worry too much about temperate phages. Maybe they're not quite as bad as you like to think for phage therapy. Um, but that's just an aside. So this is just 
pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. I mean, we're always shooting for a drug to have our <coughs> minimum toxic concentration to be as high above our minimum effective concentration as we basically can get it. And phages tend to have a large ratio, and that is a real advantage of phage therapy. That phages just are not inherently toxic. This is just uh, round two, the title is cut off. This is a little cryptic. I'll try to go through it reasonably quickly. So don't count on in situ phage host range evolution. At best, it requires no spatial structure and long time frames. Lots of people like to say, oh, an advantage of phages is that they can put them in the infection, they evolve and get rid of their bacteria. But that, that's just not quite right. I mean, if the bacteria mutate to resistance, especially if there's spatial structure, you know, you've got your mutated bacteria in here. Um, but you might have your host range mutant phage, and unless you're hitting that mutant bacteria with 10 to 5 or so phages, I mean directly, um, you, the, the two are not going to come in contact with each other. Now you could say that, oh, well the phage resistant mutant can grow up to high densities, and, and then the phage can finally find that uh, bacterium, then the phage can amplify its numbers, and it'll amplify the numbers high enough, and that'll get rid of the bacteria, but that's, oh, that's crazy. So I wrote, imagine where claims made that a drug maybe inefficiently could address a problem that was poorly defined. I mean, that's what this idea of in-situ evolution is all about. Or they call this antagonistic coevolution for a reason, not antagonistic in situ evolved phages will kill off all the target bacteria. This is a pet peeve of mine. This page has lots of pet peeves. It's insufficient to reduce bacterial challenges to below LD50s. Generally, this is a problem of insufficient delays between uh, the uh, challenge with the bacteria adding the phages. So if you've got an LD50 here, and you add that many bacteria, and 10 minutes later you add your phages, and it reduces the bacteria flow to there, and suddenly the animals are not dying, what does that mean? It means the phages can find and kill the bacteria in situ, but that doesn't mean much, especially if you're thinking about chronic bacterial infection. This is probably not as big a problem now as it was 10 years ago. Monic models of chronic bacterial infections are of uncertain quality, other than time delays, we lack defining criteria, and I've already gone through that. Often we're too limited in our therapy strategy development. Consider adding more phages, or more often, or more types of phages. So there's lots of different ways that you can attack bacteria. There's passive treatment, there's active treatment, there's this passive-active intermediate thing, uh, which is probably the way phage therapy usually ideally works. Um, active penetration is uh, taking advantage of phages and uh, lysing of bacteria um, to perhaps uh, getting rid of the biofilms of these phages, which phages tend to be quite effective at. Spots are, are limited, this is phage spotting, are limited in their utility, in their determinations of phage host range. Yes, they're a good first step for determining host range, but that's about it. And there's a paper that came out was it last year um, that talks about this. I mean, it's a great way to screen your phages for their host range. But if you say, oh, I've done the spot testing, therefore I've determined the host range, you haven't. I mean, that's a first step, it's an approximation. Claims of license from without tend to me to suggest confusion on the part of the authors. If one absorbed phage will kill, then so should many. So lots of people say, oh, I threw 100 phages in the bacteria, therefore I have license from without. That's just absolutely true. <coughs> and I wrote an entire paper on that. And I can't remember. That's one of the most cited papers. So maybe that's the fourth most cited one. I don't know. Who can keep track of this stuff? If that's the fourth most cited one, then it's part of the Okay, so switching gears. So, how much time do I have? Oh, I can slow down. So, coming out of this idea of, okay, guys, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. Obviously, not everybody does everything wrong, but it's important to point out where there are problems where the art can be improved. Um, the next logical thing is to say, okay, if you were doing everything right, then what would you pre be presented? What do I want to actually see in 
a phage therapy paper. And I, I sort of listed this out uh, in that uh, multiple seed infection thing that's uh, in the process of coming out right now. Uh, but this is a much more elaborated list. So if I could have all my wishes in phage therapy papers, what actually would be published in these papers? And this is a huge list. And maybe I'll, what I'll do is I'll go through it quickly and maybe go back again. So, just the bold part. So, where did the phages come from? You know, did they come from sewage? I mean, obviously these things are information that are included in papers, but, but these are just, like, if you could just include all this stuff, it would be great. How did you prepare the stocks? What were the titers of the phages in the formulations? Not cryptically stated, actually saying, you have to put in this many phages into the formulation. What are the details of the bacterial challenge? This is for model system. You know, how'd you add the bacteria? Obviously, again, people show this stuff, but this is just my wish list. This is everything. What are the species, variety, age, and gender of the test subjects? How were the phage formulations applied? Sometimes it's difficult to tell. What was the state of challenge bacteria upon application of the phages? So, you know, what were they doing in here? point where you added the phages. How often were the phages applied? What was the toxicity associated with the application? What were the efficacy results of the application? What potential is there for improvement of results? And how do these results compare to those obtained by others, including use of alternatives to do? phages, so for example, antibiotics. So it seems like I probably shouldn't go through all of the subheadings, but the subheadings are important too. I mean, there's just lots and lots and lots of things that could be included in phage therapy studies that would make it easier to understand what people do to repeat what they've done to improve upon what they've done, and maybe, in terms of the authors, it can get them to think better about what sorts of things are needed to go into the project itself, uh, but also in terms of reporting the project. So together with the, uh, every, this is everything that's wrong, I'm hoping to include that in the uh, complaining methods paper. Unfortunately, that uh, paper, that manuscript, is now getting up to about 12,000 words. <laughs> so we'll see how the editor feels about that. That's another problem I have, is I publish things that have way too many words. I think people, I think in the, um, book that um, Dr. Gorski told you about, um, the phage therapy one, in the review that he uh, mentioned there, one of the things they pointedly um, uh, indicated is that uh, one or two of the chapters was way, 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 way too long. But the criteria for the authors said, oh, sure, chapters up to 20,000 words, no problem at all. So I figured that there weren't. So lastly, this is uh, something that uh, I have been playing around with. It's trying <coughs> to understand phage interactions with biofilm. And this is published as well as is published uh, in the um, winter um, in FEMS microbial letter. And what I'm trying to understand is why is it that in the laboratory we seem to be so adept at getting rid of biofilm, but in the wild, the biofilms, at least people, think aren't that susceptible to phages. And one of the arguments is that it's kind of a population dynamics thing where there aren't a whole lot of bacteria around, and therefore there are a whole lot of, of, of specific types, and therefore are, there are not a whole lot of phages around a specific type, so it's tough for the phages to find the bacteria. When they do find bacteria, they want to amplify their numbers, but then it's tough for them to amplify their numbers that for enough of them to survive to find new bacteria. But this is starting to look at the biofilm itself and, and thinking, especially in terms of the heterogeneity of the biofilms, uh, the physiological heter heterogeneity, the development of biofilms, and how it is that the uh, biofilm structure uh, might be limiting the ability of the phages to actually propagate through the biofilms, the biofilm bacteria, despite the fact that you have a lot of very similar bacteria that are close together. And this actually then tags on to George's talk, just before this one, where uh, he was talking about abortive infection systems. And what I'm trying to think about is beyond abortive infection systems, we're talking about abortive infection systems that really don't work very well, but might 
in fact, slow down phage propagation, and as a consequence, give the biofilm bacteria time to maybe disseminate a little rather than be wiped out um, by the phages immediately. And this is something I'm toying with. I've got the initial ideas of this uh, in this FPMS paper. Um, but going back to what I was talking about right at the beginning of, of the seminar, of the talk, um, I've already done this talk. I presented it at Liverpool. It's only 15 minutes long. That's the URL. And for those of you, I know you can take a photograph of that, but I know, I know that actually writing something down, typing it in is a burden. So I, I've got a QR code that'll go there. <laughs> And uh, other than, so I'm working on that manuscript. I hope to uh, have it submitted by the end of the year. It's just, right now it's at about 12,000 words also. And that's all I really wanted to say. Thank you.